Johnny Candido. Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. It's Johnny Candido of Candido Training HQ. And today's video is on what type of style you use training wise. Do you use percentages, linear loading jumps, or RPE? And the answer for myself is really none, at least none of the above in a very straightforward way. So what I want to get into is why I use preset goals, but with an RPE cap, where if I violate that RPE cap, I move down in weight. But if I don't reach that RPE, I do not move up in weight. So it's half auto-regulated, essentially. So first of all, this is something that I strongly recommend you try if you're someone who does not use RPE at all. Because the biggest benefit of RPE, in my opinion, is fatigue management. I think that is the most immediate upside. Um, I, I think there's really no excuse to not just at least have it in the background. And that's why I really like using RP caps is you can say, okay, maybe I usually do 80% for a set of eight. I can just do that same 80% for a set of eight with an RP seven and a half cap, especially if you're doing multiple sets. Now that makes things very easy because you can just within reason bump that weight down. And if you violate the cap, move down to whatever weight is at RP seven, regardless of percentage. So boom, right there, you just very simply made a program significantly better by doing that. Uh, I'll actually give a very good example is Sean Noriega was coached by a team of coaches, which he's no longer coached by, probably because the lack of nuance here, but um, he did six sets of eight at a given percentage with um, nothing else attached. So you can see in the video here, he basically died. He was going <laughs> all the way and there was no, no cap of any sort, so there's really nowhere to go except Grind City. So he could have done exactly that same setup. Like I said, six sets of eight um, with a percentage and then just with the RP seven and a half cap. And if you violate that, go down the RP seven for the remaining work. That would have significantly made that work out better. The first point is that it's very easy. So it's just, you're basically making this mindless where you can visualize the top end goal and then move down if you have to, but you're not uncertain to where if you're just doing RP seven, you don't know where you're gonna go exactly. Also, the second point here is I think this systematizes what advanced level lifters often already do. So I mean by this is if you give an advanced level lifter three sets of eight at RP eight, usually they're automatically going way down in weight. If they usually can do a 580 pounds for an eight rep max on a lift, they're usually going to do something like 510 for three sets of eight at RP eight, even though that's not particularly clear. So the first set usually will move at like RP six. And then a lot of times, even their last set, honestly, is still pretty undershot. So an example I want to give here, and again, this is not me being critical of the person at all, but this is just an example of how advanced level lifters who are doing what clearly works for them, it wouldn't necessarily translate the same on paper to you guys. I think it's very important for you guys as an audience to just be critical of what exactly is going on here. So Garrett Blevins here is doing a set of three initially, and he's going to do multiple sets with exactly the same weight not bumping down on weight. I want you to guess what his RPE is. How many reps in reserve do you think he has after this third rep? I would put this at RPE four, just from the outside looking in. I'll probably rate that as a seven. It's kind of, it's kind of tough to tell with this weight exactly how hard stuff is. So now there are a ton of factors like bar speed and all of that, that can make it very hard to just judge someone else's RP like this. However, he did not move down in weight. And by the fourth or fifth set, he actually added three reps. And by the last set, to me, it looked pretty close to an RP seven again, like a really closer to that initial rating. So it's not to say that he's you know, wrong or doing anything that he should change. Of course, my point is, if you're an intermediate level lifter and you literally do RP seven, you will not be able to add three reps on that fourth set and without moving the weight down at all. So I, I think that that is really, really important to be critical that almost every top level lifter from what I've seen really underrates the RPE on their volume work. And I think it partially has to do with the fact that saying RPE four is just not socially normal in powerlifting. It's just not the norm to do that. So I'll use another example of someone who's very neutral on this because I don't actually think he uses RPE is Taylor Atwood. As Taylor Atwood's deadlifting here, he's making no claim about RPE. So I think this is a really good one. I would say there's almost no way this is an RP one or easier given it's a weight that is an extremely low percentage of his strapped uh, with pound plate max, which is nearly 800 pounds now. I believe he deadlifted like 770 
uh, with pounds and like I said, and straps. So this set with very low 500s, this is something he could definitely do 20, 20 reps with, in my opinion. So like I said, he will not say RPE one, whereas someone who does an RPE seven, RPE eight set is going to say RPE eight. I think it gets very easy to underestimate the fact that Atwood just did RPE one. So if you're using RPE, it should at least be an option that maybe a set of RPE one is useful. Um, I actually have never programmed or done three sets of eight at RPE eight with every single set at least being at RPE eight. I think that would be incredibly difficult. And like I said, I actually think very few people do it in practice even though I have seen it very often on paper. I mean, imagine doing RP8 first set, then the next set is gonna be RP9 if you're trying to cling on to that same weight, and then you move down. I mean, you just be fried. And I think that's what happens very often to intermediate level lifters. Whereas, like I said, to the advanced level lifters, they already avoid that by really contextualizing the exact loading. So that's what RP caps allow you to do. They allow you to give a lot of context to the loading. If you need to move down, you move down. And if you need to move up, you don't necessarily move up. But that relies on the underpinning idea that undershooting is better than overshooting. And the reason why I believe that is because if you undershoot, you can just extend a cycle, assuming you're still adding weight. Now, if you're literally not progressive, progressively overloading, that is a different issue. That can be a problem. But if you're adding even five pounds, and then now it's just very clear that your potential max is rising, you can just add another week. Whereas if you overshoot, you can't just move your peak up a week. That It does not work that way. <laughs> you could, you, good God, you could try to make that work. It would not. So a lot of times, if you really overshoot badly, a lot of times that peak just kind of doesn't really come back. And I think that actually can alter your rate of progress long-term. I would say most coaches nearly universally agree with this. So why isn't it reflected in the programming? If you do a set of RPA, there's a 50-50 chance you'll overshoot versus undershoot. If we're assuming you just can't ever be perfect. If you have an RP cap, then there's maybe an 80% chance you undershoot and 20% chance that you overshoot. That is a more sensible ratio if we take that assumption, like I said, that undershooting is not as bad as overshooting. But let's talk about that topic. That is exactly what I wanna get on about the, on this video. We'll have a special guest here right now, Josh and Zach from Data Driven Strength. These two guys are excellent for scientific information. So I'll include both of their uh, pages in the description. I strongly recommend you follow them. Follow them right now. No, I'm not, you know what? I might edit their part out if you don't follow them. Oh, you don't have an Instagram? Okay, that's fair. No, yeah. But anyways, I'll let them take over and talk about some of the mechanistic explanations with using very light loading in case you do hit an RP4 or RP5 set instead of bumping that up to RP7. What's going on guys? Just want to take a second to thank Johnny for having us on the channel. Today we're going to be discussing low RP sets for strength and why we think they may have a place in your program. Real quick, let's go ahead and frame today's discussion. When we're training for 1RM strength or powerlifting performance on the platform, it's really important to understand what the 1RM test is assessing. Ultimately, it comes down to what we're going to call force production. If we're looking to abide by the principle of specificity, which is often touted as the most important training principle, we need to understand we need to train in a way that is going to mimic the force production of the reps on the platform. So from a practical perspective, this is often going to be considered a single at a 10 RP or single at maximal effort. So in today's powerlifting and strength culture, you'll see a ton of people performing heavy top sets, singles, doubles, triples at a seven to nine RP to mimic the skill and the force production on the platform. Now, anyone that's been training long enough will tell you that it's not really feasible to accumulate sufficient training volume by only doing these heavy top sets. Right, so after we have these, these heavy exposures, right? Like Zach said, singles, doubles, triples in the RP seven to nine range or so, we're inevitably gonna to have to reduce the load a little bit to accumulate sufficient training volume. Even for this training volume, it's, it's important to check the box of specificity. And, and like Zach described, we're gonna to wanna to maximize force production for this volume work. So in order to, to kind of explain how to maximize force production with this volume work, I'm gonna give the example of a set of 10 to failure. So let's say you put your 10 rep max load on the barbell. And just so we're all on the same page, uh, a 10 rep max means that you, if you put that weight on the barbell and you do a set of 10, um, that set of 10 will be at a true 10 RPE, right? You cannot do any more repetitions. So over this set of 10, the reps are going to decrease in speed, right? We all intuitively know this. But just conceptually, why is that the case? Why do we see that reduction in speed? 
Um, and, and, and it's because your ability to produce force decreases as you accumulate fatigue within the set. So if we think of this example of a set of 10 to failure, it's the reps at the beginning of the set that have the highest force production, right? Those fastest repetitions. So thus, through the lens of specificity, and again, thinking about specificity as force production, it's those reps at the beginning of the set that provide the greatest strength stimulus. Now, I've, I, hopefully we all understand now why those, those early reps in a set provide the greatest stimulus, but there, there's a ton of factors and a ton of considerations that go into overall program design. So it's of course important to keep in mind other variables. One of the main studies we like to reference to, to kind of lay the groundwork for this topic is a study by Moran Navarro in 2017. The researchers split subjects into three groups. The first performed three sets of 10 repetitions very close or all the way to failure. Um, at, and then there's a second group that at the same load, subjects performed three sets of five. So that's gonna result in the sets being terminated farther from failure. And then there was a third group that matched total repetitions to group one, so 30 total repetitions, but also performed those in sets of five. So six sets of five, which also would result in those sets being terminated farther from failure. What the researchers concluded was that even when volume was equated, the reps closer to failure are disproportionately more fatiguing. So kind of combining that with what Josh just discussed, the reps earliest in the set are providing a majority of the stimulus. And as we get closer to failure, that stimulus is going to taper off. But also the fatigue is going to start very low at the start of the set and disproportionately climb towards the end of the set. So those reps very, very close to failure at a given load are actually the worst of both worlds. Right, so now we've kind of explained why those reps at the beginning of the set are, are the best of both worlds, right? They, they provide the greatest strength stimulus and, and the, the least fatigue per repetition. And, and hopefully we're on the same page conceptually, but of, of course we wanna make sure this checks out when, when, we, when we actually apply these concepts and we look at the practical research. So uh, there's a series of studies by a researcher named Preha Blanco um, and, his, and his research group um, the, the study design they often use, and I'm going to zoom in on a study um, from 2020 from his group. They had uh, four groups, and each of the four groups performed three sets. And the only difference um, between the four groups was how close to failure they took um, each set, right? So we had one group that literally performed one rep per set. And on the other end of the spectrum, we had the other group that was taking sets to failure or very close to failure. And then there were two groups in between there, right? And they're all using the same load, et cetera. So the, the group that's training closest to failure or, or to failure at times, um, they have the advantage of accumulating more training volume, which is generally advantageous. But in these studies, we often see um, that the, the groups that don't go as close to failure see slightly better strength gains. And even the groups that perform very few repetitions per set, even one repetition per set, they see robust strength gains as well. So what does this tell us? This tells us that we can really get a, a really good bang for our buck with those early reps in the set. And, and there's probably, um, you know, that, that fatigue that's accumulated within the set is decreasing the strength stimulus. And also we're, we're, we're you know, getting to those repetitions that are close to failure that are disproportionately fatiguing. So again, th this study design is really helpful for us to see this concept of those reps early in a set, uh, really providing the biggest bang for our buck. But uh, these, these studies are not volume equated. So, so, you know, it's important to take a look at those as well. However, we're really lucky that we do have one study in particular we can look at that is volume equated in a very similar design. So a study by Oliver and colleagues used a periodized design training from 60 to 75% of 1RM, um, and you, they had two different groups. The first group performed four sets of 10 that are very close or to failure, and then the second group performed at the same load eight sets of five. So again, just cutting those, those sets in half essentially to equate total repetitions, so 40 total repetitions, which kind of uh, rectifies the limitations of the Pareja Blanco studies but it also results in those sets being terminated farther from failure and probably having more fast reps or more of those high force production reps that we've been discussing in this conversation. 
And so what the authors found is the group training with eight sets of five saw significantly greater gains in 1RM squat. And then although the bench uh, 1RM gains were not statistically significant, they did lean in favor of the group uh, training with eight sets of five. So that kind of goes to show if we do equate total training volume in the way that would uh, maximize the amount of like high force reps or reps uh, that are fast for a given load, it seems to be pretty beneficial for strength. Now, it's going to be uh, really important to mention this is only a single study. So what does the literature kind of say if we kind of combine all these studies together? And that's where a new recent meta-analysis by Jukic and colleagues uh, kind of comes in. So it takes all of these studies that look at traditional sets, so sets that kind of are just your average three sets of 10 uh, prescription versus alternative set structures, including cluster sets and interset rest, which kind of mimics more the six sets of five in comparison to that three sets of 10. And what they find kind of combining all the literature together is that there doesn't seem to be a significant difference for strength between those two uh, set types. So what that tells us is that it does really seem to be the sets, the uh, repetitions early in a set that are providing a majority of the strength stimulus. And the very key factor is that while providing considerably less. Before we wrap this video up, I would like to clarify two points that could see being a big issue as far as how you guys interpret this, especially since I hope this video reaches the masses and really teaches them you know, how, to, how to train intelligently. The first one is I would like to reiterate that the singles done at low RPEs, which all of us program, myself and data-driven strength guys, all program RPE 5, maybe even RP 4 uh, or RP 6 singles. This is done differently than just training the low RPE back off volume. Because low RPE back off volume in those cluster sets does maximize your ability to produce force throughout that set. However, the higher the RPE on the single, the higher the force production, just flat out. So those are two different things because the bar speed is slowing down on the single because you're able to produce maximum force and then you just meet it with more and more load. That's different than actually being fatigued to where you can't produce as much force. So those are mechanistically different things and that could be confusing if you're just watching this video thinking low RP training is good because maximum force. That's not what's going on here. Um, also in practice, I think this additionally supports how a lot of elite lifters already train is a lot of them, as I mentioned, really undershoot their back off volume but what do they not undershoot? A lot of times it's those RP8 singles that turn into PRs. So I, I think that really supports the idea of being able to produce maximum force and then maybe taking advantage of that. And then as you're less fresh throughout the workout, you basically scale down to keep as fresh as possible so your maximum force production is as high as possible throughout the whole workout. As with everything, you have to merge this within reason. So still have your higher RP or your minimum RP7 or harder hypertrophy work sets on something like a belt squat. That I have to emphasize, and uh, I, I hope that that's already clear to a lot of people. That of course, this is as far as powerlifting work and specificity. But you don't have to dive all the way into all training just being super easy and turn into a bitch. Secondly, it's very important not to confuse maximum force production and power. Especially if you don't have a background in exercise science, it could come off wrong in this video. But what I want to be clear about is we're saying low RPE work then maintains your ability to produce maximum force and then you want to progressively overload with that condition. So velocity matters, but it is not the goal. And that is really critical when we're looking at this in practice. This is why I like using it in the context of RPE caps, to where maybe you're using 315 with an RP6 cap, maybe it's RP4 or 3 or 2, who cares? But the next cycle you go to 325, and you keep pushing it up with that cutoff point of velocity and fatigue in mind. This is very different from west side barbell training where you're trying to maximally train speed as its own independent variable. So a good example would be if you tried to use 315 over and over again and move it faster. You could very well do that and increase your power, but now you're get running into the issue of velocity being very sport specific. So that would not translate well to powerlifting despite it seeing very similar to what we're saying. The best way to think about it is we don't want you to be a faster lifter, we want you to be a less fatigued lifter, which happens to be faster. Makes sense. But I will see you in the daytime. It's gonna to turn to daytime in three, two, one. All right, that's it for the video. I'd like to again thank Zach and Josh. Links in the description, follow them. Please follow them. Give this video a like if you support science. If you're anti-science, don't give this video a like. I'm just kidding, I hate it when people use that word. But uh, anyways, I hope this video was helpful. I appreciate them taking their time out. And even I learned something, honestly, editing this video because you know, they really get in the nitty gritty of very recent studies. And I would say 2017 to 2020, hopefully 2021, 
exercise science is more applicable to powerlifting than ever before. So if you're reading old school books, I really recommend you also follow some of these guys who are giving the newer information. I would put these guys in my top five, honestly, as far as influence on me and what I learned from. So that's it guys. Make sure to like the video, support the channel, subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks for watching.